Whether you like it or not, ContraPoints, or Natalie Wynn, is the most popular representative for left-wing transgender creators on YouTube. Her costume design, mood lighting, and her myriad of characters serve to make a spectacle of herself more than her dissenters ever could. She even helped people like myself come out of an extremely harmful way of thinking about the world, and many are glad that she shone a light on an area of YouTube that was becoming a seething pit for ignorant thinking. And yet, for some reason, a portion of the left has come to learn loathe her. There was a small bubbling of dissatisfaction as Natalie began to climb the subscriber numbers. The videos became lengthier and more complex in their tackling of contemporary issues, and the online world took notice of the effects she was having on people who had previously opposed her with her more empathetic approach to her political rivals. But some who found refuge in her spaces began to feel alienated by her. Where does this shift from an up-and-coming artist to a heartless entrepreneur happen? Why has her image been warped into what it is now? I'm here to understand the exact point an audience switches from someone they see as one of them to someone that becomes the unforgivable traitor. To do this, let's look a little bit into her history. just a satire of identity politics. Natalie's early work blessed a lot of young disillusioned men into not being massive anuses by addressing common right-wing buzzwords and arguments, and debunking them pretty well. She looked at arguments against capitalism, how to recognize fascist arguments, and examined racist structures within America. The method she used to convince us of this is her aesthetic and the way she presents her arguments. There are always characters that Natalie uses to put forward an idea or a political opinion. Let's take Tabby, who is a radical communist trans cat girl. I clearly spend way too much time on the internet by the fact that I'm not even phased by the sentence I just read. Tabby is consistently aggressive and violently anti-capitalist, with a lot of revolutionary ideation in her blood. Shining a pink light on everything can cover up her counter-revolutionary Trotskyite tendency. Another character, Justine, is perhaps a foil to Tabby. She is much more clear-headed, skeptical of the level of violent action Tabby wants, and is less aesthetically abrasive to the average pair of political eyes. Do you change nothing about your strategy at all and then blame the system when the predictable happens, or do you try to improve your rhetoric somehow? These debates that Tabby and Justine have are called Socratic Dialogues, which, for Natalie, is used to put the debates in her head onto the screen, and these make sense with her background in philosophy. In the video, The Left, she states this on her pinned comment. The character Tabby represents a lot of what I think is wrong about leftist strategy. The indifference to optics, the undisguised hostility to the ideologically impure, the sectarian nitpicking, the alternation between extreme optimism and extreme pessimism. The character Justine is a mouthpiece for a lot of my complaints about the left, and the recipient of some leftist criticisms of me. Now the audience has been successfully handheld into the idea that these characters are not simply the side Natalie is on and the side Natalie doesn't like, but rather a debate Natalie is having within her own head. When we're not just puppeting the opposition to be hilariously inept, but instead giving them actual arguments to be debunked, it makes us more likely to believe that Natalie has some solid points to make, especially to right-wing people that usually are used to the likes of Big Red or feminist cringe compilations. Strawberry Epic has a pretty good video on this Socratic dialogue style that ContraPoints uses, as well as some of the more subtle methodologies that Natalie uses to make her videos more engaging, which I will link below. I don't want to just regurgitate everything they've said on this. Hail, mortals! I come to thee from my fairy grove to bring thee tidings of great woe. As for the content after this, I chose The West to be the start of her more aesthetic era, because her Socratic dialogues begin to phase out into a type of monologue style video, with Natalie but in drag featuring some other people. I am Lenora LeVay, your hostess of horror. We also see the retiring of this iconic wallpaper being front and centre of most of her videos. Each video loses the serial feeling of returning to the Wynn household in place of standalone episodes about a particular topic, which clearly benefited her well as she really began to rise in popularity during this point. The West, the Apocalypse, incels, pronouns, they're all very much individual in both presentation and the type of right-wing person that she is addressing rather than the follow-through philosophy lessons she was previously doing. 
There was a minor hiccup in her career with the aesthetic, because Tabby, according to the audience, felt as though she was framed to lose the debate, and I remember that the feelings I had watching that video felt similar to what I did watching a Blair White video. Is this real life? What? This is real life, right? Like, I'm- This is real life. There was that comfortability in shunning the ugly cat girl so I don't have to listen to her very valid points. This is perhaps the first real time the audience began to have this bubbling resentment for Natalie, and this only continues as we head closer to opulence. You know, Natalie first caught my eye in a debate against Blair White, back in the peak of the anti-SJW days of 2016 and 2017, and I distinctly remember sort of hate-watching Natalie's content because I was one of the anti-SJW people back in the day. It's gross to recall for me, as I do remember how greatly I latched onto Blair because she was a conservative trans person who was just as confused seeing a non-binary person as I was, and the initial reaction for me was to lash out. So if you are wondering, yes, I am one of Natalie's converts that got me out of the alt-right hole. Not my greatest era, but if I may ever so slightly defend myself, I also was only 16 at the time when I was watching Blair. People like myself probably can remember the exact video that sort of changed their political views to something other than just laughing at the cat girl, I guess, including myself. For me, it was America, still racist. I had never even heard of some of the evidence she had presented, such as redlining in cities, as well as the lead paint incidents which both severely impacted the development of black neighbourhoods, as well as encouraging their segregation, and she presented the information in such a way that didn't feel too aggressive, or had the lol cow energy of most left-wing people of that time. She has always had this self-awareness that provided a bit of a shield against people laughing at her sincerity, which was different to similar YouTubers of the time. So yeah, I was tided over by this video specifically, and I've been a pretty avid fan of hers since. I also started to see the repetitive nature of Blair's content too, by virtue of watching Natalie's content evolve, and over the years saw how mean-spirited and ill-thought-out Blair's videos came off, especially towards the trans community. It became easy to detach myself from that circle of people and quietly begin my new life as a filthy liberal. Oh hey Quarch. Opulence is probably Natalie's most visually exciting pieces to date. Opulence was filmed at a museum as well as including many elaborate costumes and a well-researched video which you know, is befitting of the title, right? Well, see, the opulence was the problem. The people who watch Natalie grow over the years are not the Violet Tchotchke lookalikes or the Blair White types that many people, trans or not, fawned over. Natalie became less like the image of the SJW trans trenders of the 24 Tumblr days. This softening of her image to pass as a woman, which is very much her choice and I support her in it, doesn't translate to those who actively disavowed conventionally attractive gender markers and her success as a result of her being a bit less abrasive on the eyes perhaps gives the wrong idea to those who want to live as their authentic self. We also saw how her financial position began to change. She was no longer a working class person anymore. She was gaining a fairly stable income from the videos she created, and the average transgender person is very often lower working class or struggling to live with mental health problems or has a limited social network. And as Natalie became, to us, more successful, I feel that there is this resentment that is born from that success, even though Natalie didn't necessarily lose some of the problems she had before she blew up. Natalie has become an aspirational figure and someone out of reach for a lot of people, and that alienates them from her, because that's not who she was for those people back then. She seems more like a celebrity than an ally to them now, because of the sheer lack of decent trans representation in mainstream media. For a more clear example of this resentment, it's the same feeling of seeing groups of attractive, seemingly successful people before comparing them to yourself. You may suddenly feel dissatisfied with your appearance or financial status as a result of how social media markets these people as aspirational, and I definitely am more likely to find their success repulsive, probably out of insecurity if I'm honest. Like, just look at how many of the popular gay people just happen to be attractive, and white, which is a whole issue in and of itself, by the way. 
they have the money for them to look better than we ever could, and they also have the time to make that look for themselves work better than we ever could. So why should I give them my time? While we don't have some of the privileges of the average cis white straight man, money and class in my opinion aren't spoken about enough within these discussions of online creators. Like, the amount of times a rich person does something bad and then they can just half-heartedly say sorry and shrug it off the next week is staggering compared to someone who heavily relies on their audience to keep them financially afloat. Is gender something in you, or is it a relation between you and other people? If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, what are its pronouns? Now we have a genre of YouTube that in essence has people who are influenced by the style that Natalie popularised within leftist circles, and the audience seems to respond well to this. It does not exactly strike me as surprising that Philosophy Tube began to slowly amass a viewership when adopting a similar theatrical style, especially because Abigail has a very very similar background in theatre and philosophy, and I noticed how the two audiences began to gradually meld together. I'm, to be clear, not stating that Abigail copied and or profited off of Natalie's aesthetic choices, I'm just choosing to provide the personal opinion that they share similar aesthetics. It has been for quite a few up-and-coming breadtubers, a trend to perform a type of contrapoints realness in New Left Tube, alongside a certain type of academic aesthetic that permeates the illusion of knowledge rather than making videos about philosophy innately. The popularity of this visual style is important to relay the message you wish to say to the audience and have it actually be listened to. Opulence represents the aesthetic idealism of contrapoints, the beauty of the debate and the idealised image of its debater, a suave and stylish mythical creature uttering the words of prophecy. Perhaps opulence is a magnum opus to what it is this channel started out in pursuit of, that trans people can only dream of. It is the ultimate performance of contrapoints as an entity in its most truthful form. Okay, let's not beat around the bush. Natalie also included a kind of problematic person in the video, which sent a portion of trans Twitter to cancel her the house down boots. Uh, it's not just the fancy costumes. Cancelling is a behemoth of a video, where she spends over an hour and a half addressing her accusations, particularly because she included Buck Angel, a kind of turf -y ish person, for one line in opulence. One must remember. There is such a thing as good bad taste and bad bad taste. To understand bad taste, one must have very good taste. Natalie also looked into the phenomenon of cancelling online, and again, I implore you to watch it for at least a little while because it is arguably the most important factor to present day contrapoints. This cancellation that she endured haunts her through until the present day, where she appears visibly cynical of the platform she has found for herself through her own work, and it threw open the doors to a discussion about how minorities are much more affected by the threats of their audience abandoning them than more affluent or privileged content creators, which Cat Black sort of voiced in her video about BreadTube being white. Why do we have to sit around and have conversations about why genocide isn't okay? Why do we have to have conversations about this shit? Why can't you just listen to a person of color say that white nationalist rhetoric is violent and fucking believe it? Voting more clearly displays this newfound kind of cynicism within her performance style as the 2020 US election grew closer. She points out the common traits left-wing extremists have in terms of revolutionary ideation, or rather, this dream of taking over the world from the fascist elites when, in reality, we're desperately needing to bring enough left-wing people together to just vote for the not-great politician that was recently governing one of the most powerful countries on the planet. It's kind of the left part two, if you will, but this time, you, the viewer, are tabby. You have to remember that only 22% of Americans use Twitter at all. Most users rarely tweet, and 80% of tweets come from 10% of users. So 80% of tweets come from 2% of Americans, and it's not a representative 2%. From where I sit at my rather modest little podium of People who primarily really like Bojack Horseman videos, I feel a little bit afraid of the idea of blowing up. 
When we saw a young Blair White, a young Natalie Wynn, we saw the potential within them and their earnest desire to see the point of their channel through, and I was there at both the points wherein they began to take off. ContraPoints was about addressing the right-wing dogma of 2016, Blair White was a reaction to the Me Too movement before that, and God knows what I am even about. When I see audiences growing tired of these two people, I think about the aftermath, I think about all of the relationships that these two have had torn apart from them because of the loyalty they have to their content. Not because they're innately bad people, although there are some crappy people on the internet, don't worry, but because it's how they survive in this type of industry. Grow out your mustache and tell people not to live like you. That is the best thing that you can do to help us. They're both fortunate enough to have funds to live comfortably, but YouTube isn't something with permanence, and your time does come to a close eventually. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. Fire, burning, cauldron, bubble. Something wicked this way comes. After a while, we as the audience learn the secret of the magic tricks within the creator's repertoire to hit the right buttons with viewers, and as a result, the content feels tired, done, and stale. They explain their process and their techniques so that the story becomes able to be replicated by others. That magic is gone. If you saw my sitting and smiling video, the magic of that video series comes from its creator giving no answers. It's this resistance to revelation that keeps the audience guessing, despite the content never altering its core format. You just have to keep guessing. The left-wing audiences of today are kind of tired of debate bros, the drama that happens between people, the theatrics, the sets, the faux intellectualism that comes from this, because we've seen the outcome of these events more than a few times now. I'm afraid of that click within my audience that makes them predict my next move and see through my work's mechanics and ruin the magic for them. It's kind of like remembering that in acting, the Romeo you see on stage is just an actor, not actual Romeo where you then kind of start analysing the actor's performance and looking to critique his expertise as an actor, rather than merely seeing Romeo confessing to Juliet. I guess that's why I kind of smirk and roll my eyes seeing, for example, up-and-coming Minecraft YouTubers while happily recalling the nostalgic days of Yogg's cast. Sometimes I watch my old faves because I have the internal obligation to rather than that childlike sincere interest in their content. I don't know why I get turned off by their content when I figure out their gimmick, but I just do. I perhaps didn't know the tricks of their trade that made them so fascinating to me back then, but I do now, and I have this really annoying feeling that I'm above it all. Is this what it's like to grow up? And I didn't fantasize about having sex with women, or with men, or even about becoming a woman. My fantasies were kind of platonic, almost. I would sort of fantasize about women, but in a very abstract kind of way. Natalie is perhaps one of the most sincere people I have seen on this platform. Very few people are as quick to be apologetic to people she has offended or caused inconvenience to as her. I'm not here to speculate about her private life or her struggles with mental health and substance, and whether she is different in much more private settings is another matter. Rather, I'm here to remind us of her commitment to endless research, which is commendable, and her drive to actually help people out of a bad place is also something to be admired. Whether you hate her or not, she has helped people tangibly out of bad places. Yet, I know people that don't care about intentions, about how much research her video had within it, or whether the things she said obviously didn't imply what we think it might have done. We just want to find which catchphrases to adopt and which few points she uses in the video we can use on the fly to argue against bigots. Or we look into how well Natalie has passed the ContraPoints performance vibe check while simultaneously complaining that their content is stagnating. I think we need to remember that when we see a transgender woman living out her fantasy to dress up in a Marilyn Monroe moment and feel pretty on a screen while also helping people feel better about themselves to a pretty large audience, I see opulence not as this betrayal against trans folk and a class traitor, but as a display of the idea that we live in a world where we finally even have just one person like her in that spot. I want to look up to someone like her just once, without all of the baggage that I have to bear in mind, or to keep my social circles satisfied. I actually think her JK Rowling video is fairly well thought out, and she appears to be within her element. 
there was this rewatchability that was present here that isn't so much in other videos of hers. And she employs her empathy to Joanne once again, like she did in her incels video. Fairly simple but effective setups in the monologue style and structured arrangements performed elegant. Ugh, okay, just watch the video, I'm not a ContraPoints review channel. The point I'm making here is that Natalie seems to slowly be coming out of her old ContraPoints realness performance style that was very much a thing around the opulence days, and is undergoing a sort of reimagining of her image to her audience. A large image-altering event happened to her, and it is up to Natalie to decide whether or not she wants to acknowledge her past mistakes consistently, if not for her audience to be satisfied with the checkbox of things she has to say in order for her points to feel more valid. I know this looks bad. I know you think I'm bougie and you're here to take me to the guillotine. Well, fair enough. But before you do, can a dying queen make one request? The humour comes through in the cynicism of her new image, and she uses this humour to check the boxes. I sometimes watch some of her older content and grimace, not because I personally am offended by the material, but rather I think, oh no, this isn't going to go down well with this group of people. This might be a privileged thing, as I'm very rarely the topic of Natalie's work as a cis gay white man, hence I won't be affected by her statements personally, so do take that thought with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, I am becoming increasingly sceptical of the type of audience breadtube houses, and how almost religious it feels. There's a lot of guilt associated with wrongdoings, repenting for that guilt, and appealing to your peers for forgiveness. Microtransgressions made by creators recently have been met with such unbelievable seething hatred. Burn the witch, for she speaks words of sin. Having to include in every video with at least one, by the way, I am guilty of sin, don't forget, I am sorry, just feels predatory and holds this strange power over the creator that in my opinion shouldn't be the case. The audience has, usually, the least amount of input into the entire process of the work Natalie creates. The audience is there to provide the platform for Natalie's work to be heard, not necessarily to dictate what her work should say to the letter. As I've said previously, if you watched my Sitting and Smiling video, which you should by the way, the audiences prefer to internalise an action and construct their own version of events, before sending that version of their reality to the world. Natalie works with Buck Angel. I don't like Buck Angel because they're a turf. Natalie works with turfs, so surely she's a turf and must be denied further platforming. The virality of constructing these narratives, especially through audience members, reminds me of tabloid magazines, purposefully twisting the truth for their own stories to sell better. And these posts are worded the way they are because the person complaining wants a few more retweets and further outreach, not for genuine justice. It's been something that's been looked at to death, but I guess we have an obsession with telling our version of the correct story, the correct truth. The audience has not been alienated from Natalie because of anything Natalie knowingly has done. The audience has decided to alienate themselves from Natalie because of the cultural shift that's taken place the past couple years as left-wing views began to receive mainstream popularity. And because Natalie looks into the semantics of bigotry, it was only a matter of time before the audience used her own trick against her, and for that to be her undoing. So keep your magic a secret else you might just be burned at the stake for your sins.